are you saying, people? It's another episode of the panel. Hey, listen, the panelists, you guys ain't left, you know. Back for another episode. Mm. Hey, bro, the last one was oh, amazing. James. Fire. James up the gems. Gems. Amazing, man. But wait, 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 wait. Did, did you hear that? No, did you hear that? <laughs> guys, did you hear that? Every time you do that, it throws me off. No, no, no. Did, 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 Arlene, did you hear that? Yes. You heard it, yeah? Or did you hear that? Did you hear that? Yeah? All right, guys, look. Right now, yeah? You see it? Right now, the little bell? Yeah, you might should be pressing it. Look. Press the bell. Ding! Yeah, press it. It's somewhere. Listen, like, subscribe, and share. You Listen, we don't have to tell you. And it's free as well, you know? Mm. We're not charging any of you to literally subscribe to our thing. Yeah, so you like, subscribe, and you share. You know about our... We're on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. My man's being along with the Apple thing. It's coming, it's coming. You know, it's coming. but we've got so much things that Patreon's are coming. Patreon's coming too. Yeah, Patreon's coming. It's going to have a lot of CPD. And actually, yeah, no, nah, do you know, on the real, like, Patreon is definitely coming soon. And um, talking of CPD, like, you know, we're going to be doing youth offending, education, mm. and social care as well. So um, I'm going to put myself under a bit of pressure. I think we should do that for. I'll say like May, June. Yeah, we should. Let's make it happen, yeah. So And also as well, guys, yeah. So for any like social students, if you're watching, these episodes, you can use them as CPD, mm. you can use them as PDP as well. So if you're on placement or if you're a social worker, you can use it. You know, social England renewals coming up soon. Any episodes that you watch of myself and Rob, just put it in your CPD. It's also as free. well, um, our website is it's coming. There's, there's an announcement, I say next week. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, next week, yeah. So, the website's there. On the website, you'll be able to, like, um, see the panel, Spotify, YouTube, TikTok. More importantly, you'll be able to contact us as well regarding any social care, youth offending, education matter, local authority, mm. um, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, look out for that. And, um, yeah, we're here to help. That's the thing. We're here to help. We're here to build com a, a community, more importantly. Do you know? Yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah. But, yeah. Right. So... This second episode is a bit more deeper, you know. So we've done the whole CPD thing. Mm. Today's episode is about reflecting on today, yeah. So we had a lot of speakers who spoke about um, their own experiences. We had speakers talk about research. We, we heard speakers speak about um, stigma, racism, um, inequality. And it's just about kind of being real, yeah, about what our community is actually facing. Now, I'm going to happily just kick it off. It's, it's no secret that racial inequality exists within social work. It's existed for time and it's going to continue, yeah? But because of that, it's rippled onto, um, obviously, mental health services. Now, recently, I don't know if all of you probably would have seen here, but recently, um, there was a lady um, in, Li in Liverpool, a um, black, black woman who, unfortunately, she passed away. And basically, the post on the shade bar spoke about mm. unconscious bias yeah, that yeah. led to her yeah. death, yeah? Mm. And I did a big reaction on TikTok to that. Now, for me, it's the same thing in mental health services. I'm just going to keep it real. There are a lot of practitioners, yeah, in this field who do have unconscious bias, and they bring it into the workplace, yeah? There's a lack of cultural competency when it comes to black mental health. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things, I think it was um, Rita, um, you were kind of saying, particularly with our, um, our young black boys and how they're often um, depicted by a lot of professionals um, in terms of their emotional well-being, not seeming to have, you know any kind of concerns regarding emotional health, but seen as young black boys who are aggressive, um, who are truant in, and actually there's, a, there's not a level of duty of care for us. So it's just about all of us here being open, being real, because I'm quite passionate um, about this, but what's your take on what you've heard today? Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? Anyone feel free to jump in. And don't be scared here. Like I said, I've just said what I need to say, innit? Um... I'm going to go and I'm going to raise the point of unconscious bias. Go on, um, I'm, I don't agree with the term um, on the basis that I think it, I guess, oversimplifies or even brushes over the bias. I think perhaps you might not be aware of the root or the cause of your bias, but you're aware that it's there. You're conscious that it's there. You're conscious that when you treat a patient or a person differently you're treating them differently mm. I don't think you can go into a situation and um, I use the example of my wife for example giving birth that you can process that two women are giving birth and I'm treating them differently mm. and not be aware that you're treating them differently you might not know the history of slavery of 
all the other things that have led to, you know, medical bias, all of those things that have led to why you think that way, but you're aware it's happening and you're aware you're doing it. My personal opinion. I know but something as simple as food, like I'm biased towards my mum's cooking. I'm aware of that. Mm. <laughs> I might go down to the intricacies of, well, it's the smell I smell when I was waking up, all of that. But I know like it might not even be different, but it's my mum, so I prefer it. Okay, Shamari. I'm going to come with that because I disagree with that term as well. I can't bear unconscious bias. I think we mess up and mix up social work. We're always stealing people's terminology. So one of the things is that um, Freud talks about unconscious. Mm. Yeah. And so we've now got that into our psyche that we're unconsciously biased. No. Yeah, you might not be aware, as Shamari said, but the moment, it's like, you know, we live in the UK. You can live in Hertfordshire, but you watch television. Yeah? Mm. So you can't be unconscious of it anymore, right? You are biased, and I accept that, but not unconscious. And we need to stop allowing people to get let off the hook by saying unconsciousness. Yeah. I think what we also need to be thinking about is our value base. And my research, Dr. Wheat again, was on, on how effective we are at using our personal and professional judgments. Mm -hmm. That's what I looked at, our value base, how we bring our values into our work. And so if we accept that we all bring our own values, our personal experience and our professional um, experiences, and we're making judgments based on that, then we get into a place where we can do something about it. Mm. My students often hear me bang on the wall when they talk about institutionalized racism. Is it in the walls? No. Yeah. The institution is made up of all of us with our individual biases in terms of race or sexism or um, homophobia. And what we do is let ourselves off and we let everybody else off by saying, unconscious bias or institutional. Yeah? Yeah. We all have to take our responsibility for what we do. Just before, oh, sorry, Andre, just before I let you land, sorry, I think what you said, Arlene, it reminds me of um, Becker's labelling theory. I remember when I studied that at university and it, um, the module was called Values and Diversity and it was actually about us being aware of the labels that we use. And in terms of this particular topic we're talking about as well, there are a lot of labels from those professionals who use that with a lot of um, black men and black women who are experiencing mental health and therefore the care that's being afforded to them isn't there already because obviously you've already got those labels already so whatever we're going to be experiencing there's going to be no duty of care and I think you're right I think sometimes unconscious bias um it's kind of like a slap on the wrist it's just an easy way for you to escape yeah and I think you know you talk about values and ethics which is like what I teach and most of my students don't like it because I teach them about philosophy okay because you have to go way back in terms of some of those labels the 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 people that we use um, we refer to in terms of references were racist. Mm. Okay, so some of the psychological things like Freud, I love him. I'm a psychodynamic in my heart, but actually some of those things he was sexist. He was he was racist, and so we're using those as models to look at modern day things. We need to know that and understand that those labels are still being carried forward, mm. and so we need to kind of drop them and be current in terms of looking at issues around mental health. Yeah. Etc. Go on, Andre. I wasn't ready yet, but um, I think we refuse to see bias as a society anyway. We refuse to see racism. Um, it's like you could go to your colleague, oh, um, that black guy over there, and then they're like, oh, you can't say that, and they refuse. It's, it's this re literally people refuse to say, oh, England is racist and racism exists in England. And then on social media, I don't know if people watch I'm a Celebrity, when Nella Rose does something in the camp, and then the whole world online is making racist remarks, calling a monkey, but England's not racist. Um, and we need to acknowledge that no. there is bias in all of us. Um, it's like, for example, me, I, um, I'm pro-black. And I have to acknowledge that I'm pro-black because when I work with white um, service users, I have a pro-black mentality and I need to work against that when I'm working with them. And they need to work... when. If you're a white practitioner and you have a pro-white mentality, you need to realise that when you're working with black or other people from the global majority. Okay. Rita? Uh, this one is a, is a slicey topic for me just because 
I, 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 I absolutely agree with everything that's been said because I just think unconscious bias is a very English way of getting away with being racist. Um, I, I think it's a very polite way of explaining away disgusting ways of thinking about people. Um, and you can just easily explain it away by saying, I didn't know it was there. Start with the lies. Okay, because there is no time that I have experienced racism or there is no time that I have experienced being in an uncomfortable situation that I do not feel that that person knows what they're doing. Mm. The, the energy doesn't lie. Um, and I just feel that this, this little plaster that they put on of always oh, unconscious bias, it's a lie. You know what you're doing. Mm. Oh, Susie. Yeah, I was going to say with like all of the brilliant comments that were made and when they were talking about the weight and the gravity of labelling, it's not just we've labelled this person this and only us practitioners know it when we're processing them through the system. We've labelled them that so it's easier. It's the self-fulfilling prophecy of what they take in and how they start behaving and how you've ruined the trajectory of their future because you mislabeled a young person, especially if that young person is in the care system. So the local authority or the government is their parents and you've gone and labelled them that way. Sure. So I think the power of self-fulfilling prophecy, um, we just need to acknowledge that. I think another thing is, is um, how everyone's talking about systemic issues. It's not enough to just go into social work, go into work and youth offending and schools and be a good worker. You have to be an anti-racist practitioner. Right. So the system already is racist and you have to like understand the system, educate yourself and then work against those racist things in real time, which is why it's good to constantly go to CPD programs and talk to professionals that have more wisdom. But yeah, I want to bring the panel um, to can a couple I, of things. Can I say something? Oh, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. I've got this saying, yeah, I hate saying it all the time, but um, like the world is changing, right? Yeah. Now, um, co when was COVID? Four years ago? Four yeah. years ago? Four, yeah. four years ago, right? So, since COVID, what's changed? What what has changed since COVID, right? Yeah. In fact, what's changed from ten years ago, twenty years ago, or thirty years ago? Yeah. For me. And I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm one of the most um, motivational people that you ever uh, meet, but I'm quite um, uh, broken and cold when it comes to certain things. Just get on with it. I'm always getting stopped in my car. I'll tell you, I'm always getting stopped in my car. Yeah. And I'm, and I, and I'm driving my car with my um, local authority badge on, it says who I am, it's got my name, it says Robert Dyer, you, um, you know, probation service. Yeah. And they stopped me and I showed them the badge. And when they show, and then, and then when I showed them the badge, oh, all right, mate, yeah, you're right, yeah, yeah. But I'd just get on with it. There was one time I cried one day, right? I'm not, I'm not a cry, you know. I don't want people to think I'm soft enough, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. But um, there was one, uh, yeah, it's probably about three years ago. Um, I was in Hammersmith and um, I got stopped by by the roundabout by Apollo. And that day I'd done three home visits. I went to one semi-independent to see one of my young people, a case. Um, I went to do a home visit. And then um, the last visit was to take a young person home to his um, semi-independent. Right, no, in fact, what am I talking about? Sorry, the first case was uh, took a young person to court. Then it was a semi-independent, then taking a young person home. And I thought, right, I'm, just wor I'm working. I'm actually working. I'm not doing anything negative. I'm actually trying to like give back, do my job role, be a positive male role model. And they made me feel like shit that day. As I said, I don't cry enough, but I was pissed. I was angry enough. Mm. Uh, apologies, yeah. So, um, as I said before, um, as I, said, I don't mean to be negative, but I'm quite cold to a degree. I just get on with it now. Do you know what I mean? And sometimes it is hard to be, it's hard to be positive and, you know, give, you know, positive vibes and motivational, but I, I, I just got this attitude, yeah, whatever, I just get on with it and everything, yeah. But I know we have to do better and continue to, like, help each other, support each other and try and find different strategies and ways, you know, to go around it and have a different mindset, do you know what I mean, as well. But it's difficult sometimes. It's, it, it really is, yeah. First of all, I'm sending you the warmest hug. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's important. I think it's important to see black men expressing emotion and, and, and expressing moments of vulnerability. I think it's, a, it's really, really important for other young people to see that, um, especially on these sorts of platforms. So pick up yourself and I'm sending you a big, big hug. Oh. Um, but you asked a question which just sort of um, pricked my thinking, which was what what has ha what has changed since COVID? What's what's changed? And I think COVID has changed a, a number of things for us. First of all, bring up big up working from home. Woo -woo. <laughs> 
Um, but what one of the other things that is is changed is I think that it drew people into the digital marketplace, mm. where yeah. that scene where you could have potentially been in your car, upset by yourself, frustrated with a situation, you might have called someone before. It might have been your bestie. You're calling them, and you're you just kind of talk and let that go. Whereas now, I think what COVID done for people is allowed them to become very, very comfortable to share a large part of themselves on social media. 100%, yeah. Right. So that scene where you are upset in, in the car could have easily been a TikTok reel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it was. Um, so, and picked up traction. Uh, oh, it was. No, no listen. No, so, okay. So, so, so um, um, there was a van mm -hmm. and everyone was filming me. I, so, but I was so I, I said to the police, oh, "Look now, you're making me famous. Come on, this is not good." <laughs> so, so it's definitely yeah, so, highlighting. Yeah. Um, I think what COVID has helped us do is to highlight some of the issues that people are facing. I don't think there's been an increase necessarily. I think there's just been a larger focus and a light being shone in some of the areas where there was darkness. What I wanted to ask in light of what everyone has, has gone and said is that one of the things that Sh um, Shamari spoke about he he gave two case studies yeah of um two black men yeah in regards to their uh, mental health and he was kind of sp speaking um about the fact that so one young black male had no criminal convictions the other one did have criminal um convictions and already there were stereotypes already by those professionals working with them not looking at um, him as a person mm. but just seeing a black male in front of you criminal convictions and actually the easiest thing to do is not give him that service so how is it or where or how is it us as professionals yeah, particularly black professionals are able to challenge that because mm. it's a problem that um, is continuing to happen across children's social care yeah. across education and what's happening as well is that you have a lot of young people particularly our young black boys mm who don't want to speak on, on certain things because automatically they feel, well, you know what, there's a label against me. But us as black practitioners in here, what can we do to challenge? What can we do to change? Anybody in the panel, what's your thoughts? I know it's a very generic question, but it's a question that has to be asked. What let, can we do? Let me say something for 20 seconds, yeah. So there's a thing in the black ethnic minority ethnic group, it's called pride, yeah? Right? There's a thing called pride and ego. And... Um, uh, Acting like like acting like we can't do specific things or say specific things, right? Yeah, but then as Ria said, um, one of the things that I have loved personally about social media is being able to be vulnerable, right? Yeah, but there's also a toxicity where it's quite toxic on social media where you you see things like self harm and they get a thousand likes or um, mm. banging on your head on, on on I don't know on the on, on the on the wall on the door whatever whatnot. Um, so there's there's a, so part of it is like crazy, part of it is great that it's you know that it's okay to be vulnerable, and then the other part is just messed up. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Mm. Right? Yeah. And it's like, how do we you know get the balance right? And more importantly, how do we safeguard these young people and also safeguard ourselves as well? Because I'm not gonna lie to you guys. I'm, I'm I'm sorry to turn it a little bit left, right? Yeah. Sometimes when I go on social media, I got I got I got. A, just come off it for a couple of days because mm. my head is too much. I've got a headache. Do you know what I mean as well, right? Yeah. But for me as well, um, it all comes down to um, individual. Yeah, so us as an individual, you know, us personally, right? Yeah. Where are we? You know, what are we getting out of it, right? Yeah. Because I know me as a man, as a black man, as a practitioner, as a professional. And um, I always say to Nana, right? Yeah, like we've got several Devon hats on, right? Yeah. Like, you know, your brother. Yeah, you know, your uh, your manager, your man as well, do you know what I mean? Mm. And um, it's actually okay to cry. It's actually okay to, like, I'm having a bad one today, bro. Or I can't cope, do you know what I mean? Right, yeah. And I've got friendship groups where um, um, they've cried in front of me. I'm like, right. It made me feel so uncomfortable, you know? Yeah. Because you know, normally when you might, I might see, like, me and my mum or my sister or a female friend or um, a female work colleague, right? Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, are, are you okay? Yeah. But you know, you see, when it's a man, it's like, right, wow, brother, you're, are you all right, brother? And I feel uncomfortable. I'm thinking, I can't even hug him, you know? Like, you know, but I want to hug him, you know? But, mm -hmm. like, you know, it's, it's, so it's how do we handle it, you know? Because 
we've also got to show that it's okay to be vulnerable in front of them as well. Do you know what I mean? So, but as black men, we have to. And we I have think, to as well. Yeah. And I think obviously a lot of black boys. Um, are not kind of seeing that vulnerability as well. No. Do you know what I mean? Because, like, the ones that... So I'm just speaking in terms of my local authority, the, the children who currently in, in care and the black boys who I speak to, yeah. if I go to speak to them, and straight away, if you're going to go and say, well, actually, you know what? We've got an in-house psychologist. Later. No, I'm not mad. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah That's yeah, straight yeah, away yeah, what they're going to yeah, say. Yeah. No, I'm not mad. You know no. why? Because they don't want to be vulnerable. Mm. Do you understand? Go on, Alina. Vulnerability. I think that starts with the parenting, okay? And we have this image as black women that we're strong and we're tough. Up, and we pass that on. And we pass it on inadvertently because we're not trying to pass on be strong and tough. We're just trying to get through the day. And in that, we, we send out a message to our daughters, you've got to be tough like mum. And we send out to our boys that I need you to fix up because there ain't no man in the house. You need to be the man in the house. Mm. And so soon or later, the boys pick up on that in the same way the girls pick up on that. And we perpetuate this. We have to do that. And that's partly also because we are taught. I know I was taught by my mum that you've got to be 150, 60, 70 percent stronger, bigger more educated than the others. And we need to come back and draw that and just try to be like everybody else mm. and, and not to feel that that's a wrong thing in terms of our vulnerability. Okay. Um, so that's number one. You asked about social workers, what can we do? Um, I think one of the things that we do is run conferences like this. And what was interesting to me is that I gave people a brief. I said... I want you to talk about your experience in working in mental health in some shape or form and in the audience of social work. And what interests me, nobody knew each other. And yet everybody talked about their positionality, their vulnerability. And they all talked in some shape or form about being in their respective workplaces and dealing with those issues. If I go to Peter, who was our second um, keynote speaker it's really difficult for us as black academics to get funding for research to look at the issues that we know is important so I have to take my hat off to Peter that he managed to get some funding to look at issues we can't look at issues unless there's evidence and Rita you mentioned about research often our research is done by white people talking about us we need to be in a place that we can talk about ourselves and it has to start with the conferences. And see if we Go on, Andre. <laughs> you know what? Um, Arlene just sort of touched on it already, but it's just when you were talking about black men need to be presenting as more vulnerable. Um, I would wanted to just touch on the point of, I'm so tired of being strong. I'm so tired of being strong. Um, and it took for me to see another um, professional who looked like me in a senior position. I saw her break down um, after a very difficult meeting. And it was in that moment that I was just like, oh, so she's not this ironclad iron lady. She's just normal like me. Um, and it's from then that it's actually really important for me to turn up as my true self in every single room that I enter. So with my students, they know when I'm having a bad day. They know when I'm having a wicked day. They'll probably know from the playlist that is playing, because I play music at the beginning of my lectures. They'll probably know from the playlist how I'm feeling. But I think it's really important for us to turn up as our true selves and to advocate for, to, for being vulnerable because we're not robots. And like I'm saying, this work is exhausting. <laughs> Listen, I'm a black man and I'm a crier. <laughs> Honestly, it's, there's so much power in feeling the emotions. Um, I, I've had to learn how to control that because sometimes that means when I'm working with a ser service user, I meet them where they're at. Mm -hmm. And I've had to learn, like, I cannot meet children where they're at. Like, you know, you're giving me attitude. I can give you attitude too. But I think it's really important um, if you're feeling emotions, even if it's not in that moment, go and feel them. Yeah. Take that time. 
um, because part of not feeling that emotion is burnout and getting overwhelmed and not being the best person that you can be for the people that you work with. Um, so yeah, if you need to cry, go away and cry. If you need to get angry, go away and get angry. Um, there's always a space for that, whether that's um, in activities or anything. Just express your emotions. Don't lock things in because it's going to be bad for you and it'll be bad for the people that you're working with. Um, <clears throat> I think when I think of the concept of black mental health, I think of like the advice my parents gave that you have to be twice as good to be to get half as much as everybody else yeah. as a yeah. black person. And my mom said, as a girl, things are going to be very, very difficult. And they said the number one thing you could do to equip yourself and fight against this system is educate yourself and speak for others. So I try to know as much as I can about racism and how to get out of it and come to conferences like this. Like there was a lady that was talking about um, databases and digital um, digital um, systems and how to do stuff. But then I was even thinking, what if the person who's putting in the data is racist? And then we were talking about um, someone who had done all this research on black mental health. And I'm like, what if the policies aren't enacted? What if this isn't, this paper itself isn't taken seriously? So even when we're trying to solve things, there's still a war against our uprising and a war against um, our greatness. But we have to keep going and we have to stay educated. So like when I was coming into social work, I made sure to think about what it means to have, like, for toxic masculinity, the war on the black family, the demonization of the black man, adultification of young black girls, microaggressions that I might even have to face in the workplace, not even the workplace yet, but placement before I'm even qualified. I made sure to educate myself so that when I face it, it won't demotivate me. I'll be resilient and then I'll go up and change it. But yeah, you have to equip yourself with education and um, be ready to be hurt, to be battered, to be bruised, um, but to win in the end. Come on, Jamari. Um, I just want to say, you go back to what you said, Rob, about like what, can we do for black men? And my thing would be for those of us, it's a call to action, um, for those of us that know better, to um, do better, to help, to reach out, um, to care, to show, as you said, show vulnerability. I think it has to start somewhere. And what some of us, the ones that know, have to be the ones that break through. We can't be like, I'm comfortable with it, but I know you're not comfortable with it, so I'm not going to. And then we never do. Like this week I had, like for myself, I think a mental health breakthrough. And there was like an hour or two on Monday, I just cried. And I was like trying to just stifle it. And I was like, like I just had to, it, it stopped and it happened again. And I had to sit with and process what's actually going on with you right now? Because you don't cry. There's something going on with you. And then from that, I was like, okay, this is your issue. Deal with it. And then how can I help up? Now I'm dealing with it. Now I understand it. How can I help others? And I think that's just we, we just have to start. Like, we just have to start stepping up and doing it because no one's going to come and do it for us. Um, we've seen it. We know it. We live it. Nobody coming to save us. Yeah. We've got to save each other. And, and just to say, I mean, one of the things, just because of time, is that um, Susie made a point about, you know, having that talk from your parents that actually you need to do very, very well. And, you know, I had that a lot from my dad that, you know, you need to nana work twice as hard. And I guess for me... Not really a sad thing, but even though I'm doing so well, I still feel pressure on my shoulders anyway. I still feel that even though I'm doing so well that um, I need to actually go and do better. And I say to, um, I have a lot of these conversations with a lot of these black boys as well that I've worked with um, and trying to steer them away and trying to say to them that, you know, we have to try and be better. But even with me, I also have to get to a point to say, actually, you know what? You've actually done very, very well. You need to take that pressure off you. It's something that I'm still through, kind of like working through, even with, you know, doing this with Rob, going to the unis, showing what I'm doing. I still feel that I need to do good. And to be honest with you, it's, it's quite unhealthy. It's actually not good for my own uh, mental health to feel that, you know what, I I'm craving to do more and I shouldn't. I need to be saying to myself, you know what, I'm satisfied with what I've done. Do you know what I mean? And having those conversations with those boys to go and say, you know, actually, it's not this is not the only route. You've got other routes. And obviously, if you if you get something and you do well, celebrate your wins. Yeah. And, and, and you know, right? Yeah. So um, I always say, oh, yeah, to be in our line of work, you've got to be a little bit crazy, you know? Because you, you, you do, right? Yeah. Because the thing is, right? Yeah. You've got to deal with home life. Yeah. 
you might have a partner um, or boyfriend, girlfriend, or issues with your children, whatever, whatnot. And then remember, you're going to deal with other people's problems. Mm. Yeah? And remember, these problems, they're not normal problems, you know. They're deep problems. Yeah? Child protection. Yeah? Um, you know, disabilities. You know, um, children passing away or children being, being removed from their parents and everything. These are mentally and emotionally draining things, you know. You know, and you know, also as well, it's about also looking after ourselves, mm. learning when to switch off, yeah, learning to say no, I can't take that case. Do you know what I mean? Like go to the gym, you know, ladies, get your hair done, do your nails, like go out, have a drink, no, demand them, you know, get your hair cut, go raving, go to the gym, you know, self-care, mm. you know. So like it's a lot, you know, and life is not easy, you know. Look at the cost of living. I love coconut water, three pound fifty. <laughs> 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 yeah, man. No. But yeah, can brother. I say, yeah. Can I say so something? One is, I want to come to. Let's have final reflections yeah, on the yeah, panel. Yeah, yeah. So, Arlene. Can I just say? I mean, it's interesting, Rob. I think like I'm tagging with you today because <laughs> I started the day saying about looking after yourself. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that's so important for us to all recognise that that's where you've got to start, and not beat ourselves up because we're good at that. And that's the point you're saying, Nana. But also this is where I'm going to get radical here, is that the, Im the impact of slavery took years to get here. The getting rid of it is going to take decades yeah. and hundreds. And, and I think some of what we do is think that those legacies can get rid of really quickly and they can't. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about, as I started off, I was talking about mums, we, somebody in the audience talked about, sorry, not in the audience, some, one of our speakers talked about chastisement, for example. That was a protection, yeah? We've now got a society that says you shouldn't chastise your children, and we get it, and it's right. However, that was often a black mother's way of protecting their child so they didn't do the wrong thing and the slave master did something to them. We also split up our black males from our, they, sorry, split black males from their family. And why were you crying when you know you're never going to see your wife again or your children? So those are things that are really deep-rooted and so they can't be got rid of quickly. Mm. But we need to be kind to each other and let go little by little of those sort of legacy things that we've been taught and then unfortunately we pass them on. Um, and so, you know, people often say to me, are you really happy that your children are educated? And I'd like, yeah, but that was all they were going to do. Well, no, my children would tell you that that was not what I said to them. Yeah, they did what they wanted to do. And I support them with what they, just because I'm educated, that doesn't mean that's the right path for your children. And because we get taught that education is our ticket out, yeah. which is, it is, can be, but if you're never going to be an academic, my children would tell you, you couldn't take mass communication and you couldn't take home economics or what was they call it now? Food tech, yeah? Because I can teach you how to cook, yeah? And what career are you going to get? For me, it's more about the career. If you're going to be a plumber, be a plumber. You can yeah. make more money being a plumber. Mm. Yeah, you don't need to have a degree. And I think what we're doing is giving people lots of pressure to do things that they're not capable of. Go on, Andrea. I think from a student standpoint, I think social work education talks about being person-centred, cultural humility, cultural competence, and I really urge people to know what that looks like in practice because if we're really doing those things, we shouldn't be having these conversations. Uh, final reflections. Stop with the struggling yeah, us as a community, we need to move away from this struggle love, struggle life, as if it's a badge of honour. It's not. It is damaging our mental health. It is damaging our parenting. It's damaging the foundations that we're laying for our children. We need to move away from this struggle, struggle stuff. Yeah? Let's adopt the soft life. Yeah? yeah? <laughs> I'm, I'm in my soft life era at the moment. I'm really moving away from struggle. Please, guys, look after your mental health. Susie? First. Um, we're, um, we're under pressure, like as a community, we're under pressure. And I know it's like, similar to what Rita said, like it becomes like a popular thing, like, oh, pressure makes, pressure makes diamonds. Pressure also crushes people. Mm. And more times than not, it will crush you. Acknowledge that you're under pressure. Build what you need to build to protect yourself from that pressure, like 
you're going to face it. It's inevitable. But do you have the coping mechanisms to deal with it? When you notice someone else is under pressure, they might not even see it. Notice it for them and speak. I see you're under pressure. How are you feeling? How are you get Like, do that for each other. Do that for yourself. Because that's the only way you're going to make it through. Because if, you, if you're not aware of it, if you're not attentive to it, it will crush you. Sure. Susie, final reflection. Yeah, we're having all these brilliant learning experiences about black mental health and what it could potentially look like in the future. We're learning to equip ourselves with resources and language and stuff. And we're learning how to be better practitioners for black people. But you can't look at the progress without looking at the past and the root. And the weaponization of black mental health has been prevalent for years. If you come out as a black person and say, oh, I have this mental health issue, I'm going through this, you are brought down like a ton of bricks by your own community and their ideologies, and then by the world around you. And I think it's um, something that also helps black people's mental health advance is in the learning to let go. Like I am from an immigrant family, and so are a lot of my friends, a lot of people from my area grew up in a working class area. And um, a lot of the reasons why they had mental health issues is because they were carrying ideas and roles and behaviors from back home straight into the UK. And when they came to the UK, they never realized that their identity in and of itself um, was hyper politicized. Mm. And then they have this horrible psychopathological experience of you don't deserve to be here. And then they have to prove hey, Susan, Susan's on fire today. I know, I know. Mad. It's just that whole, Mad. It's just that whole thing. But yeah, yeah, back to what Dre said. Let's get the resources. Let's be more person-centered. But mm. I think never forget the history, yeah, like Armin yeah. said, yeah. of why we are where we are. Mm. Um, and never forget your story. Well, listen, panelists, thank you so much, honestly. Amazing, amazing, amazing. It's been absolutely brilliant. Um, thank you to our audience. Um, thank you to UWL for having us for these two so episodes. Audience, can we, can we have yeah, a round of applause for the audience. Amazing, amazing, yeah. amazing. You know, this has been our, our, our first live panel event, mm. two episodes, but thank you very much, guys. You know where to find myself and Rob. You like, subscribe, and share. And uh, we'll see you soon. Peace.